from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Here's what's ahead. K-State's Robin Reed joins us to announce that the latest Kansas Agricultural Land Value Trends book is now available from K-State, a highly valuable resource for a variety of purposes, and Robin will tell us about it. She'll be followed then by K-State's Gabe Sampson. Gabe going over the findings of his new study of biofuels production expansion in Kansas and the ensuing impact on land values and groundwater usage for crop production in the areas those biofuels plants are operating. And on this week's wildlife management segment, K-State's Charlie Lee reviews a study of grassland snake activity following a prescribed pasture burn. All this and more straight ahead on Agriculture Today. A social distancing tip. While the CDC urges you to avoid close contact, like hugging or shaking hands, there are other non-physical ways to say hello. Wave, wink, use sign language, salute, smile, give the peace sign, throw up an air high five, do jazz hands. Remember, stay a minimum of six feet or two arms length away from others and stay home if you can. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Thanks for being along with us for another Agriculture Today. We'll pass along to you during this segment what is always eagerly awaited information out of the Agricultural Economics Department at K-State. It's the latest edition of the Kansas Land Values Report. And joining us now is the individual who is largely responsible for making this happen, Robin Reed, agricultural economist with K-State Research and Extension. For obvious reasons, Robin, land value information is highly valued by agricultural producers and a whole lot of other folks out there. Yeah, obviously this affects a lot of things in an agriculture operation, you know, expanding your operation and buying land is the obvious one, but a lot of it is also with credit. So this makes up most of the net worth on a farming operation is the value of the agricultural land. So obtaining your operating loan and other securities with your operation depends on your land values. So what we do every year, and this is actually the third annual time we put out this comprehensive book. It's 70 pages, 72 pages this year. In fact, we take land sales data from the Property Valuation Department out of Topeka, and we package that in a way to be most meaningful to those in the agricultural community that want to look at these values. So again, this is the 2020 data. So This is last year, and I want to remind listeners just the different things that we experienced last year and how that translates into these land values. So 2020 was one of the most volatile years in agriculture that we've seen in a long time. And that was earlier in the years the pandemic hit. We saw commodity prices really decline. We saw some large government payments, CFAP 1 and CFAP 2, would probably be familiar to most of everyone out there. And then by the end of the year, when we got to harvest, we had strengthening exports to China. And all of a sudden, we had our commodity prices coming up to levels that we haven't seen in six years or more. So we rode the roller coaster in 2020. And it was very interesting to see what that translated to in land values. And I think most of it is probably not going to be seen until this year in 2021. But I'll hit the highlights here of what we saw in 2020. And that's what we'll do. We'll talk of the general overview of land price trends in Kansas. But noting, Robin, that the book does break this down region by region, farm type by farm type, and so on into some considerable detail. Yeah. So what we do is look at nine crop reporting districts in Kansas. And that's just to match what National Ag Statistics Service does or any of the data that you see on farmlands typically using these same nine crop reporting districts. And then we also look at county level values if we have enough sales to do so. And the way I look at the land value is three different types. Irrigated cropland, non-irrigated cropland, and then pasture and hay ground I combine into one just so we have more observations. But it's important to note I'm really trying to capture the ag land value. So I only look at parcels that are over 70 acres in size, assuming those are selling for ag land. 
And I try to take out any extreme outliers if we have some really low values as a family-to-family sale or some really extremely high values as such as going to development or something like that. So I try to clean this down to just ag value. The broad trend, as you look at the state in its entirety, then, were agricultural land values up, down, constant, from 2019 to 2020. Sure. So to start out with, I'll say 2020, when we look at the volume of land that sold, was a pretty average year. So when we had a run-up in commodity prices, we had land sales that were roughly 500,000 acres per year in ag land. Then we saw with the downturn in the farm economy, we saw a lot less land on the market. We were down to selling, oh, 315,000, 330,000 acres per year. So again, 2020, as I said, was probably about an average year, and that's about 420,000 ag acres sold across the state. So that's roughly equal to the five-year average that we've seen. Now, the trends in there are interesting to evaluate, and I want to just put perspective on how we look at this at the state level. Most of the ag land that is sold is heavily influenced in the Southwest. So as I said, we had 420,000 acres sell in 2020. Over 100,000 of that was just in the Southwest crop reporting district alone. Hmm. And that is influential because that is the area that has the lowest crop prices as far as non-irrigated cropland. So when we're looking at the state average, What is to note is that really drives the state average. The Northeast Crop Reporting District is some of our highest land values, obviously. Brown, Donovan, Atchison County, some of our highest land values in the state. But a very small volume of land is sold in that Crop Reporting District. Last year, for that whole Northeast District, that was roughly 20,000 acres. So the state average, again, is very influenced by those different regions and their prices. The past year in hay ground, on the other hand, is heavily influenced in east, central, and southeast areas where you have the Flint Hills region. So when I'm showing these average state values, it's interesting that non-irrigated cropland and hay and pasture ground aren't that much different. And that's just because of that regional influence on those values. So with that as kind of a precursor, let's dive into the numbers here. So non-irrigated cropland across the state last year sold for 2000 $32 on average across the state. This is down not even 4% from the five-year average. So my summary of 2020 for non-irrigated cropland is we are remaining flat. We saw a little dip in 2019, but we are right now back up to what we saw in 2017 and 18. So again, we had so much volatility last year, we didn't see decreasing prices. We remain flat, but I anticipate 2021 we will see those increasing. For pasture and hay ground, the average across the state was $1,906. And this is a little higher, actually, than 2019 and 2018. So we are approaching levels that we saw between 2016 and 2017 as far as that pasture and hay ground average. Irrigated cropland is a lot more variable. We saw our peak back in 2015, we saw a drop after that, and then it's kind of been bouncing around ever since. So in summary, I'd say that's flat too. There's just a lot more volatility because there's not near as much irrigated ground on the market. But at the state level in 2020, that averaged $3,247. So you throw all of that into one pot, so to say, Robin. What does this suggest about land value trends in Kansas? Seems like stability is the uh, descriptive of the day here. Yes, I would agree, Eric. You know, like I said, we had a lot of volatility in 2020, but we ended the year strong. And that translated into pretty flat or holding steady land values. Now, what I anticipate going forward in 2021 is we are going to see some higher land values. We've been in a fairly depressed market you know, holding steadier than we expected it to through this downturn in the ag economy. But now we have commodity prices increasing. We had another round of $20 per acre payments that were announced about a month ago. And, you know, things are looking up this year if we can have decent yields. I know we have some dry conditions still persisting in parts of the state. 
but that will translate into higher land values and probably some higher cash rents as well. That tends to be what happens when we have extra money in the ag economy is we have inflated land values, which is good for farmers like I started off with as far as credit conditions. We want our land value increasing. That builds our equity. But for those that are wanting to expand or purchase some land, obviously that's going to be a little more expensive going on into the future here. Again, the numbers that you shared were the 30,000-foot view. Producers and anybody else who would like to know more about what's happening, more to their locale, they need to get the book either online or the hard copy coming out soon and dig into the numbers and the enterprises that they're interested in and uh, compare apples to apples. Yeah, so I mentioned this is a 72-page book, and that's all not just talking about the state trends. I try to break this down to as close to home as I can get it, and that's at the county level for these three different types of land, irrigated, dry land, and pasture and hay ground. So when you get the book, you can look up crop reporting district summaries, you can look county level summaries, and that's really the value in this book. So you can get it now by going on agmanager.info, and there's a section on farm management that you'll find land buying and valuing. Otherwise, all of our 105 county extension offices will be getting print copies of the book on a limited basis, but they will have quite a few that they can hand out, but that'll be probably a few more weeks yet. So I would encourage everyone now to go on to Ag Manager and take a look at that web version. You want to acknowledge as well, you say, Robin, there is one resource that makes this very book possible, and it wouldn't happen without their support, obviously. Absolutely. This is just not me and the Ag Econ Department. This is a partnership between the Kansas Association of Farm Managers and Rural Appraisers that helps bring this book together each year. So we definitely want to thank them for their partnership on this wonderful resource. It takes a lot to pull all of this together. So, Robin, congratulations for that. It's a job well done, and thanks again for telling us about it. Thank you, Eric. Robin Reed from the Agricultural Economics Department here at Kansas State University, letting us know that the third and latest edition of the Kansas Land Values and Trends book is now out. And we'll be back with more. You're listening to Agriculture Today. With the shortage of primary care physicians, especially in rural areas, health education and disease prevention are vital. K-State Research and Extension programs address quality of life, personal development, and health behaviors across all life stages of all social economic groups. To learn more about health education, one of K-State Research and Extension's five grand challenges, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. We're back now on Agriculture Today. Our guest on this part of the broadcast has just completed an analysis with help from colleagues answering some key and important questions relevant to Kansas agriculture, to be certain. And he is from the Agricultural Economics Department here at Kansas State University, Gabe Sampson. Gabe, what you looked at here was the expansion in bioenergy production and what that suggests about irrigation usage and land values, tying this back to the state of Kansas and our agricultural conditions here. I'm going to ask you initially, what's the motivation behind this work? Yeah, a couple questions. You know, we've seen a large uptick in ethanol capacity and the number of grain-based ethanol plants in Kansas Uh, in the last 20 years. We've gone from about three ethanol plants to, to 12 ethanol plants in a a statewide refining capacity of about 40 million gallons per year up to over 500 million gallons per year. Corn is the staple fuel stock for ethanol production in Kansas, and corn is also the most water-intensive crop in Kansas. And so, you know, the, the two questions we're interested in is, has the ethanol market growth in Kansas affected irrigation water use through incentivizing additional irrigated corn acreage And then what has been the effect on irrigated and non-irrigated land values? We'll take those separately, but how do you get at, and we'll start with that irrigation side, and making that link between this growing bioenergy output in Kansas and corn production and then water used for that corn production? Yeah, so on the irrigation side, we have a pretty unique data set. We have data on about 20 
3,000 irrigated fields in Kansas from uh, 2003 to 2017. The hypothesis we have is that when an ethanol plant opens, uh, that incentivizes grain corn production because the price received net of transportation and other costs around that ethanol plant go up. And so we sort of look at these irrigated fields in the neighborhood of an ethanol plant uh, after it opens up, and we pretty much compare irrigation water use before and after the ethanol plant is opened. And when you look at that, the geographical range, the proximity to the plant, what would that be typically? So the the neighborhood that we define is 50 kilometers, so that's about 30 miles. Uh, this neighborhood is a neighborhood definition that's been used in the literature, and it's one that we adopt in order to increment off the literature, and it's supported by these land use studies that have been published to try and connect changes in land use uh, before and after an ethanol plant opens. So did you find a definitive relationship between the debut and the operation of an ethanol plant and the volume of corn production in that roughly 30-mile radius? Yeah, so we find pretty clear evidence that irrigation water use does increase for a field when an ethanol plant opens up. Uh, We find that for a a 10% increase in ethanol refining capacity within that neighborhood, total irrigation water use increases by about five acre inches per field per year. So that's about half of an acre foot per field per year. So it's not insignificant. Not insignificant. So if we sort of tally all the cumulative effects over the past 15 or 20 years of uh, ethanol market expansion, uh, we predict that the cumulative effect on water use uh, is about 4% per year currently. And then you relate into it, the crop mix might change as well on that acreage, which is even more far-reaching then. Yeah, and so one might expect that irrigated corn acreage increases when an ethanol plant opens up nearby, and the trade-off of increased irrigated corn acreage might be decreased irrigated acreage of other crops such as soybean and alfalfa, which are also water-intensive staple crops in Kansas. And that is, in fact, what we find, that we find an increase in irrigated corn acreage and and decreases in irrigated alfalfa and irrigated soybeans. So there is a defined impact on irrigation water usage related to ethanol plant operations. Then that other side of the coin was, what's the ensuing influence on the value of that land on which the corn is grown? Yeah, so I think a pretty natural segue here, and this was a a process that we started out from the irrigation approach And we have this really great data on uh, land values from the property valuation division of the Kansas Department of Revenue. And so we had the ability to to segue this project looking at, well, what has been the effect on land values? So one might expect a similar rationale with the irrigation. If price received for corn net of transportation and other costs goes up when an ethanol plant gets constructed, then one might expect that that gets capitalized into land values. And... If corn is relatively water intensive and you need irrigation to sort of meet the difference between crop water demand and precipitation, then that uh, capitalization might be different between irrigated and non-irrigated lands. And you discovered what in the way of this relationship? Yeah, so using a similar neighborhood definition of about 30 miles. And so if we look at farmland sales within 30 miles of an ethanol plant before and after they're constructed, uh, we find that after construction, uh, irrigated land values go up by about 9 to 10%, and we find that non-irrigated land values go up by about 5 to 6%. Once again, the impact is fairly definitive, isn't it, in that respect? Yeah, so there's a, a relatively larger impact on irrigated lands, which is uh, one of the hypotheses that we were entertaining after we, we did the irrigation study. Now, there are extenuating factors here, such as, and you noted this in the summary of this work, how much government support is in place to maintain and uh, perpetuate biofuels production. Yeah, and so a natural question might arise that if land values are going up, what's so bad about that? And there's, there's nothing inherently wrong about land values going up. You know, two points I would make is, number one, the value of land is oftentimes the largest component of a producer's wealth. And so any factor that is affecting land values is important from a policy perspective because it's affecting producer wealth. 
Uh, the second point is if ethanol market expansion is being supported by government policy and, and subsidies spent on fuel mix uh, mandates and things like that, then to the degree that which land values go up due to ethanol market expansion, those land values staying high might depend on continued uh, government support for these policies going forward. Mm-hmm. And so if those policies go away, one might be concerned that there would be a corresponding drop in land values. How do you hope that this information will be used, Gabe, as we think about the future of biofuels production, a possible further expansion? You would expect, if that were to be the case, that these trends would hold true moving forward, wouldn't they? Yeah, so, you know, one thing that's unique about Kansas is it's an arid state, and especially as you go west. So irrigation is generally... Uh, an important part of grain corn production in western Kansas. And so if we continue to see ethanol market expansion in these arid and semi-arid states, there might be concerns about added stress placed on socially valuable groundwater stocks. And that I think is something that we need to take into consideration when we're evaluating these bioenergy policies. And could it not as well be applicable to water use policy in Kansas? Because it all meshes together, really. Certainly. I think, you know, taking into consideration in Kansas and elsewhere, you know, one might draw similar conclusions in in Colorado or New Mexico, uh, other uh, Western and Midwestern Corn Belt states. You know, can we design water conservation policies that might act to mitigate some of these unexpected consequences that we see from ethanol market expansion and, and bioenergy policies? You say that this work has garnered interest on uh, several levels already, including some of the uh, groundwater management districts in the state of Kansas. Very intrigued by what you've come up with. Is there some place that other parties could go to learn more about your research here and what it says? So these have yet to be published. We're still in the process of publishing these. The irrigation study has been published as a conference paper uh, with former student Amer Al Sudani and Uh, fellow faculty member Jason Bergtold. And then the uh, land value study is a paper we'll be presenting at a a conference this summer with my grad student Grant Gardner. And so we don't yet have a publicly accessible uh, version of that paper, but we will this summer. And you note that the land value data may be updated here because that's been refreshed just recently here. Yeah, so this this data is the most recent land values data we have is from 2017, and that's because we started this process, you know, last fall. And and so, 2018, 2019 land values data would it would be interesting to update this analysis to include that. Well, these are insightful findings on the influences of bioenergy production, and uh, specifically as far as the impact on irrigated crop production supporting those biofuel plants, and then how that then reflects and ripples into land values on that acreage. So quite a piece of work here. And we appreciate you, Gabe, telling us about your research. Good luck with further refining it as need be. Thank you. And thank you for coming over and telling us about it right here. Anytime. Gabe Sampson is an agricultural economist here at Kansas State University and one of the co-authors of this new analysis, Irrigation and Land Value Response to Expanded Ethanol Production, pertaining to the potential for that expansion continuing here in Kansas. We'll be back with more for you on this Agriculture Today. Stay with us. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Broadcasting from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you as we move on now to today's agricultural news headlines and the latest Kansas crop progress and condition report from the USDA reads like this. For the week ending this past Sunday, our top soy moisture supplies in good shape. 
7% surplus, 76% adequate, and 17% short to very short. Subsoil moisture at 5% surplus, 72% adequate, still 23% short to very short there. The winter wheat crop in Kansas this week is rated at 55% good to excellent and 29% fair, 16% poor to very poor. Wheat now jointed is at 50%. That's very near the 52% average for the date. And corn planting now 15% done. That's near the 17% average for the date. Emergence at 1%. That also right on the average. For the national view on crop progress now, we turn to the USDA's Stephanie Ho. USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey has the latest look at the progress of the nation's winter wheat crop. 10% of the crop is heading on that date. That is behind the five-year average of 14%, also behind last year's 13%. Although the heading pace is behind schedule. That's a little piece of good news as we are expecting a significant cold wave this week that could threaten jointing to heading winter wheat. But that's a story for next week. As of April 18th, we see overall heading progress into double digits in just five states. He adds that there is no weekly change in national numbers for winter wheat condition. Locked in right now at 53% good to excellent, 17% very poor to poor. As I mentioned, no change from last week. This year's crop rated a bit lower than what we saw this time a year ago when it was 57% good to excellent and 13% very poor to poor. Rippy looks at corn planting for the week ending April 18th. Overall progress for the country, 8% of the intended corn acreage planted by April 18th. That is equal to the five-year average and slightly ahead of last year's pace. But it is worth noting that the weather across the Midwest was wide open nearly all week. So you would normally expect a faster planting pace. Corn emergence is ahead of both last year's pace and the five-year average. We also have our first look at soybean planting for the week ending April 18th. National progress, 3% planted. That's ahead of the five-year average of 2%. Also slightly ahead of last year's 2%. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. And the word is that President Biden plans to name USDA Senior Climate Advisor Robert Bonney to be Undersecretary for Farm Production and Conservation. If confirmed by the Senate to that role, he would oversee the Farm Service Agency and Natural Resources Conservation Service. Next up for you, this week's edition of Milk Lines. With that, K-State Dairy Specialist, Mike Brook. Mike? Today I'd like to visit with our Kansas dairy farmers concerning some calls I've been receiving about somatic cell counts in our herds. You know, as we approach the uh, springtime weather and the mud and things that go with it, a lot of times we see an increase in somatic cell counts. And I think this is partially uh, increased this year because of the cold weather spell that we had about six weeks ago now. And I think we're still seeing some effects from that. One of the things that I wanted to visit with you about today is just how do we get the bacteria into the ends of the teats of our animals? And really, there's about four main ways that that happens. One is direct transfer, where the animal lays down in manure or a contaminated stall that uh, allows for the bacteria to come in direct contact with those udders through that soiled area. Another way that it happens is from the leg. As cows walk through manure or mud, they get their feet uh, coated and sometimes even up onto the legs. So when she lays down, she might accidentally get a foot underneath her, and it happens often when she lays on her side, and that can come in contact with those teat ends as well. We can also have splash transfer issues where animals are walking through a more of a liquid uh, slurry, and that tends to splash upward toward the udder, and sometimes that will come in contact with the ends of the teat. And then the final way that we see it happen is with tail transfer, and sometimes this is actually fairly common as we look at freestall housing. If the tail lays over into the alley as the cow is laying down, it may come in contact with some manure and, and water that might be there in the alley. When the cow stands up, now the tail is wet and that wetness also contains bacteria and as she swishes her tail around may come in contact with some of the teats, particularly the rear teats. 
on our animals. So when we think about all this possibility of transfer, cleaner cows obviously will have less issues with transfer than others. That's the reason why we've come up with these ways to score the animals for hygiene, and generally we score in three different places. One would be the udder itself, the other would be the lower leg, and the final place we would look at manure contamination would be the upper leg and flank. As you can imagine, as we have an increased coating of manure on these different areas, we see an increase in mastitis. And this can be very true in many situations, and we can track these hygiene scores in relationship to what happens with somatic cell count in your herd. And generally what we're concerned about is we're concerned when those hygiene scores reach a score of three or four on the four-point scale. Scores of one and two really aren't much of a problem for us in general, but so we get a greater amount of contamination, and that's the reason why the score goes up, we see a greater incidence of mastitis. Now, it is possible to have animals that score very clean on the hygiene score but still have issues, and one of those things that we sometimes run into is the sand bedding on our free stalls. If sand bedding becomes heavily contaminated with bacteria, and many times during the winter months and early spring, if we're reusing sand, we do not get that sand quite dry enough before we put it back into the beds. Also, if we do not let that sand sit for four to six months before reusing it, we can run into a problem. It may look clean, but it still contains a high level of bacteria. In some cases where farms are experiencing higher somatic cell counts and the animals seem to be clean, you might want to check the bacteria count that we actually have in the back of those stalls. It might be necessary in some of those cases to come in, remove some of the sand from the back of the stalls, and replace it with new sand that has never been reused. On dairies that have experienced these sorts of things, it's not unusual to see their somatic cell counts actually drop by half once they replace the sand with clean sand. So, this is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension, encouraging our dairy farmers to maybe look a little bit beyond just the cold weather that we've had as they start to evaluate what they might be seeing currently in somatic cell counts on their dairy herds. Thanks, Mike. And this is Agriculture Today. Burning prairie grass is essential for Flint Hills ranchers. Following grazing and burning best practices can ensure that the prairie remains intact while not smoking out downwind neighbors. The Kansas Flint Hills Smoke Management Plan helps guide prescribed burning on prairie land. To learn more, visit www.ksfire.org. Again, that's www.ksfire.org. Closing out this agriculture today, once again, we visit with former K-State Wildlife Specialist Charlie Lee. Charlie's along each Tuesday to talk about yet another aspect of wildlife management. Well, Charlie, we are on the back end of the prescribed burning season here in Kansas. It's been going on for a few weeks now, and we'll conclude here shortly. You have information from a study on the effects of prescribed pasture burning on snake activity. And uh, we've seen studies of this ilk for various species in the past, haven't we? Yes, there's been studies looking at reptile and amphibian responses to burns in woodlands or forested areas much more frequently than I see information on the effects of burning on snakes in prairie situations. So we know that in those woodland situations, uh, the effects really depend upon the changes to the habitat. And in those wooded areas, when the fire is of a high enough uh, temperature and when the fire is severe enough to reduce canopy cover, that it can affect reptile and amphibian populations. However, Most fires in woodland areas are not at high temperature and don't change habitat conditions too much, so the impacts to reptile and amphibians is largely non-existent. However, what's been done in prairie situations shows that fire effects do impact arthropod numbers, primarily grasshoppers, 
We know that fire changes the abundance of small mammals. It often increases small mammal populations. We know it can have either a negative or a positive impact on birds. However, those reptile responses have not been well studied. So this particular research effort looked at fire in various watersheds with various burn frequencies on Cons of Prairie at two different times of the year, early right uh, in the spring, and then at those population responses in the fall from August to October. And the spring activity uh, was done from May to June. Some of the particulars here then, how did they gauge those responses exactly? Well, they trapped snakes using four different drift fence arrays on each watershed. The watersheds were fairly similar, fairly close together. Uh, Each of those drift fences consisted of double-ended funnel traps that were five meters apart, and those drift fences were made out of hardware cloth that would be 12 inches tall and a quarter inch size mesh with the funnel trap spaced every five meters along those fences. They were uh, located along the slopes and in lowland areas near ephemeral streams and they sampled a similar proportion of lowland and upland prairie in each watershed. They then uh, trapped and identified species that were captured Uh, handled those individually, uh, marked those individuals, and ended up capturing 92 different individuals of six different snake species on that particular research effort. Just common species we would see in the prairie ecosystem? Yeah, the species uh, that were captured included the North American racer, uh, the Great Plains rat snake, uh, king snakes, milk snakes, uh, gopher snakes, as well as the common garter snake. So they would be species that are, are very common in tall grass prairie. So they took a count on these species. Then how did they arrive at conclusions on the impacts? Well, they, they looked at the number of species and then compared with, the, with the statistical analysis of different snakes from different type watersheds, those that were burned uh, more frequently than others. Uh, The results showed that the species richness uh, differed uh, little between the burned and the unburned prairies. Uh, The burned actually found six species. The unburned prairie had five species. They captured fewer snakes on the recently burned prairie, uh, which was only 32, than on the unburned prairie, where there were captured 60. During the fall, they had similar numbers of snakes that were captured in each treatment, and that two species, the North American racer and the common garter snake, composed of about 79% of all of the snakes that were captured. The North American racer and the common garter snake were captured more frequently in unburned than in recently burned prairie during the spring. We know that snake activity in Kansas peaks in the late spring, and there's a kind of a smaller activity peak in the fall. They thought perhaps that there's still snakes that would be in their hibernaculums at the time of many of fires that are in early spring, and perhaps that would account for maybe some of the lower numbers of species being captured than they had anticipated. In the main, though, the impact of burning not really detrimental to the long-term ability of these snake species to thrive? Well, this uh, research article suggests that snakes uh, can have a short-term negative response to spring burning. However, they can quickly reappear on burned areas of prairie when there is areas that are unburned immediately adjacent so that they suggest that these unburned refugia areas are an important element for prescribed burns uh, if we're concerned about snake populations. And again, this research was conducted on the Kanza Prairie, aligned with Kansas State University just outside of Manhattan, looking at prescribed burning, how it influences snake activity. Charlie, we appreciate the look at this today. Many thanks. He's Charlie Lee, longtime wildlife specialist with K-State Research and Extension.
Before we part today, I want to mention one more time the Kansas Range Youth Camp coming up this summer, June the 15th through the 18th. Bringing it up here because this camp does feature a rangeland wildlife management education component. It is sponsored by the Kansas section of the Society for Range Management. If you know of an eligible student interested in ranching, in natural resources, or wildlife, this would be an outstanding educational event for that young person. The site will be Camp Menisca in Kingman County. The registration deadline is May the 15th, but the spots fill up quickly, typically. So look into it by contacting your local extension office or conservation district office. The 2021 Kansas Range Youth Camp, Camp Menisca in Kingman County, June the 15th through the 18th. Our time's away for today. Thanks for being along with us. Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.